Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Jeffrey Veen. I'm a user experience manager here at Google, and it's my pleasure to introduce Alex Wright today. Uh, Alex and I have known each other probably for about 10 years through the Information Architecture Summit that we go to every year and stuff like that. Uh, Alex has been designing uh, information and organizing information for websites for over a decade uh, and uh, has been running in many of the circles that many of you in the user experience group do as well. So he's sort of, uh, we run into each other all the time. It's really quite nice. Um, in his career, he's built, uh, you built the first Harvard Library website. Do yeah, it had something to do with it. All right, let's, let's say that. <laughs> but the first Harvard right, right. Uh, library website uh, founded and led the user experience team at IBM in the 90s, uh, co-founded a search startup called Rolio, and has done user experience work at Macromedia, Yahoo, and the Long Now Foundation, and is now an information architect at the New York Times. Uh, so thanks for coming all the way out for us. That's great. Um, his new book, which is available over there, uh, he's selling copies extremely discounted for about 20 bucks a piece, uh, is called Glut, Mastering Information Through the Ages, and it chronicles the ways that humans have collected, organized, and shared information for more than 100,000 years. You go way back. That's great. Awesome. Please help me welcome Alex Wright. Well, thanks, Jeff, and thanks for, for coming out. Is this, is this on? I guess it is on, yeah. Um, great. Well, so, uh, so as Jeff mentioned, I've, I've been looking into this whole question of how we've been organizing information over the years, and I wanted to just sort of talk a little bit about where, this, where my interest in this came from. Um, you know, like uh, most of you in this room, I've been working on the web, you know, for, for a living for the past 10, 10, 12 years or so. And uh, I feel like, you know, it's, it's sort of hard. We're at a, the web has become such a dominant sort of cultural force in that period that it's, um, you know, it's, all, it's very hard for us, I think, to, to really appreciate um, sort of what the world was, you know, what the world could have been like without uh, the web as we know it today. And so what I've been sort of looking into is the whole question of, um, you know, sort of how did we get here and trying to look at historical precursors to things like hypertext, um, uh, and networked information systems. And as Jeff mentioned, my book takes sort of a long view of some of this stuff, going back into even human prehistory, looking at the history of writing and uh, the history of the printing press and so forth. But, um, but for the purposes of this talk, I really wanted to focus on sort of a, a narrower subject, which is the, uh, really the history of hypertext. And what I wanted to do is, is just sort of talk a little bit about some of the systems that preceded the web. And I feel like, you know, in the technology industry, we tend to have a kind of a myopic fixation on the future. I think there's a tendency for us to always be looking forward. And uh, I think that's something about sort of the nature of computing. It's a very sort of linear thing. And I think it always keeps us sort of looking in a certain direction. But uh, I think there's some value in trying to step back and take maybe a longer view and take a little more of a historical view of, of sort of how we got here. And as I've been uh, looking into this over the last couple of years, I've uh, become interested in some of the systems that, that emerge really in relatively recent history, but sort of just before the web. And uh, it's interesting to look at these systems, I think, in light of where we are with the web today, because I think a lot of us are starting to realize, are starting to bump up against some of the fundamental limitations of the web. You know, there are certain things about the basic architecture of HTTP and HTML that, that are somewhat limiting. And today, I think we're in, in, uh, in a period where people are really trying to sort of work around those, some of those limits with things like, you know, Ajax and, um, you know, looking at some of the new sort of Web 2.0-y kind of things out there. Um, but it's interesting to, to take a look back and, and see how uh, some of the people who were thinking about this stuff a long time ago actually anticipated some of these problems and came up with some interesting solutions that I think we can, we can actually learn something from. So, so what I wanted to talk about, uh, for starters, was sort of the, the very early history of the web. So this was the, the first reference I could find to uh, somebody having an idea that looked something like the internet. So this is a guy named Charles Cutter, and he was a very well-known librarian in the 19th century. He was uh, actually the co-founder of the American Library Association. He was a uh, sort of contemporary of Melville Dewey. Everyone knows the Dewey Decimal System. He was actually a big rival of Dewey, and he had a different system um, that is actually the one that the Library of Congress uses. And he was a very kind of visionary librarian. He's kind of forgotten today. But he wrote this essay in 1883 where he was trying to imagine what a library might look like in 100 years. And he had this crazy idea of something called a keyboard you know, <laughs> um, that uh, could have some kind of wire connected to it and uh, that you, know, you could punch up something on the keyboard and something would appear on a screen, like you'd be able to pull up a book, right? So it's pretty good. Huh? 
So a few years later, um, H.G. Wells, I'm sure everyone's heard of, a famous science fiction writer, uh, wrote a very influential essay called The World Brain. And he uh, had this idea that, and he sort of, this was I think in the you know, 1930s that he wrote this, he had this idea that over time as he saw what was coming with radio and you know, TV was just around the corner and that you know, increasingly you know, microfilm was becoming a big thing, and he anticipated that uh, over time all of this in recorded information would become increasingly connected through some kind of distributed network. And he had this idea, I mean, he was a sci-fi writer, he had this idea that the whole thing would kind of come to life somehow and there'd be some sort of new kind of uh, consciousness would emerge out of the network. I mean, he was, but he was serious about it. I mean, it wasn't, this was not fiction. I mean, he actually uh, saw this as a, a fundamentally new kind of intelligence emerging out of the sort of networked uh, information environment. Um, he also described the whole thing as, an, as a sort of vast uh, networked encyclopedia. Which is interesting, because that's a term that seems to come up a lot in, as people were thinking about this, this stuff. Um, another, uh, I think, important precursor was a guy named Teilhard de Chardin. And he was a, uh, a Jesuit priest uh, who wrote quite a bit in the 40s and 50s. And he uh, was an interesting character. He was actually uh, banned from publishing by the Catholic Church, who considered his writing a bit heretical. Uh, he had this idea that he wrote, wrote a lot about networked information and this notion that um, uh, that elect, the growing sort of universe of electronic media would create new ways for people to communicate and uh, collect and share information. And he went a little bit further than that. He also had this idea that uh, over time that activity would would let people sort of uh, would alter people's consciousness in some way, and that there would be some sort of uh, he had this sort of idea that people would kind of approach a divine consciousness by having had this sort of unfettered access to information and this sort of changing media landscape. So that was where the Catholic Church started to have a problem with him. Um, but even though he never published any, he couldn't publish during his lifetime, everything, was, everything he wrote was later published uh, posthumously, his uh, essays actually, uh, he circulated them privately to friends and acquaintances, and he actually developed a pretty uh, uh, enthusiastic following, among, especially among fellow Jesuits, uh, one, of which was a, a young, one of whom was a young grad student named Marshall McLuhan who uh, actually took de Chardin's ideas as the basis for his whole philosophy of the global village and so forth. So, so he was you know, also seemingly onto something. So. But so this was all kind of theory up till now. I mean, this was all, I mean, interesting stuff, but none of, this, no, none of these people were really actually building anything. They were just sort of you know, philosophizing. Uh, in the 1930s, there was a guy named Paul Otle, who I'm, I'm curious, has anyone here ever heard of Paul Otle? One or two, oh, a couple, wow, a couple of people, okay, that's pretty good. That's two more than I ever get when I give this talk. Um, so he was a, a Belgian fellow, uh, and he was a, a information, sort of one of the early information scientists. He was kind of a librarian, but he would have described himself a little differently. He was kind of a theorist of information and documents. And he wrote quite prolifically um, about the sort of um, future of information science and the you know, theory of documentation and how to organize information. He uh, created uh, a whole classification system called the Universal Decimal Classification, which was kind of the European answer to the Dewey Decimal System. Um, and he wrote these uh, uh, quite a few books about his, his theories. He also founded an institution in Belgium. It was called the Mundaneum. And what was interesting about the Mundaneum, it was a really a, a new kind of uh, institution that was this, unlike traditional libraries that were really about collecting books. His fundamental insight was that there was a lot of information contained inside of books and that if you could develop the right framework to sort of, sort of liberate that information from inside the books, you could actually uh, create whole new ways of interfacing with that information and sort of remixing that information and letting people stitch together their own new kinds of books out of the information that was sort of in those books. So this diagram sort of illustrates his basic uh, idea. So just to try to explain this briefly, the idea is there's, you have kind of a classification system that organizes all this data that was uh, this is the state of the art storage technology during his time was index cards. So. Yeah, so things were pretty durable. <laughs> it lasts longer than most disk drives. <laughs> so, um, and uh, that information is pulled out of books, which ultimately comes out of people's heads, who apparently have lucky charms sort of floating out of their heads. <laughs> 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 I'm not quite sure if that's all that. But this is sort of his basic framework, right? So it was pretty far-sighted. Um, and he had uh, 
his books, most of his work has actually not been translated into English yet, but uh, he, has, he had a great facility for sort of visualizing information and uh, sort of explaining his ideas through, through visual metaphors. Um, those are some of his sketches. Um, not quite sure what that one's all about. But anyway, he, uh, so he actually built this thing. This wasn't just an idea. He actually created this thing called the Mundaneum. And it was built in Brus near Brussels, uh, as, and this was all happening around the time when the League of Nations was forming. And he had this very utopian vision that as the League of Nations took shape, there would be a, he would have this uh, sort of global information warehouse that would be available to anyone in the world. And he actually uh, convinced people to, to fund this, and he actually got a prime piece of real estate in Belgium uh, and built this whole um, institution. And he had it staffed, and he had people basically going through and uh, just plowing through huge volumes of books and extracting all that information and putting it onto in index cards. So what were they about? Well, it depends on the books. I mean, I think for the most part, we're talking about nonfiction, right? So we're looking at basically facts, uh, bits of information with references to the original book that they were contained in. So it's hard to generalize, but it's sort of anything you can think of that's in a book, you know, facts and figures and, you know, bits of data. And then there, the idea was that this information was then stored on these index cards and classified using this classification system. But there was a little more to it than that. It wasn't just sort of a top-down uh, catalog. He also, and, and this I think was the, the big idea that he had, uh, as people use this information, that became part, that usage became part of the record. So as somebody came in and you know, pulled out a piece of information and then went and looked at another piece of information, they, that became part of the actual catalog record of the, of the information, of the data, so that it became sort of a bottom-up system as well as a top-down system. And he had this idea of what he called the social space of a document that would emerge by looking at the ways people use the, the information and then from that deriving some understanding of how one document related to other documents. And so that each doc, no document sort of existed in a bubble, but that it was, you know, your understanding of that document was informed by the documents that surrounded it, right? So it was pretty, pretty close, yeah, pretty close, yep. Yeah. So, uh, so there's a documentary that was made about uh, Otley a few years ago, and I'm going to show a brief excerpt from it. And I don't, uh, did I get the audio hooked up here? Let's see. I don't think I have an audio feed. Is there anyone? I can play it off here, but I don't think it'll go. Let's see. You know, in a pinch, I can probably just play, bend the mic down and play it off this. Yeah, we'll see if this works. I think this will probably work. All right, a little experiment here. Okay. Otley publishes his most important book, The Treatise on Documentation, the book on the book. This is where we find the most visionary pages, where already the concept of the computer emerges. Here, the workspace is no longer cluttered with any books. In their place, a screen and a telephone within reach. Over there, in an immense edifice, are all the books and information. From there, the page to be read, in order to know the answer to the question asked by telephone, is made to appear on the screen. A screen could be divided in half by four or even by ten if multiple texts and documents had to be consulted simultaneously. There would be loudspeaker if the image had to be complemented by oral data and this improvement could continue to the point of automating the call for unscreened data. Cinema, phonographs, radio, Television, these instruments taken as substitutes for the book will in fact become the new book. The most powerful works for the diffusion of human thought. This will be the radiated library and the televised book. So, so okay. That was, this book was written in uh, 1934. The documentary was made recently, but the, yeah, that, all that was from 1934, right? So, that's pretty, yeah, yeah, well, he saw it, yeah, I mean, he saw it coming. Uh, 
so, right, so why has no one heard of this guy, right? Uh, well, I mentioned he built this in Belgium. Well, we all know what happened in Belgium in, uh, I think it was 1939. Uh, the Nazis marched in, and they promptly gutted the Mundaneum, carted out all the index cards and threw them away, and uh, made room for an exhibition of Third Reich art. And uh, Otle basically died in obscurity about four years later. Uh, you know, the whole his country was ravaged, his life's work had been thrown away, and he just, you know, was completely, basically forgotten. Uh, after that, for about uh, 25 years, he completely just fell into obscurity. Uh, in, you know, post-war Europe, people had other things on their mind and uh, rebuilding their, you know, their, their countries. And uh, his papers were basically locked away in an in a, uh, obscure little office in a corner of a building, and it was, they'd been locked up for 20 years, and you know, it, was, it was just completely forgotten. Uh, until uh, this grad student, a library science student named Boyd Rayward, happened to uh, somehow uncover a, a reference to him and started getting, became fascinated by him and actually trekked to Belgium and tracked down his address and got somebody to let him into his office and found this you know, office full of cobwebs, you know, just cluttered everywhere, and he went through the process of actually, you know, sifting through his papers and actually sort of started to reconstruct his legacy. And uh, Alea is finally sort of getting his due, um, but he's, it's been a long road. And I think part of the problem is that the, the heritage of the, you know, the, the internet and the, it's coming out of sort of, uh, you know, the Anglo-American sort of, you know, world, uh, and just given the cultural forces that have taken shape since then, you know, the contributions of sort of obscure Belgian information scientists who never wrote in English have been sort of overlooked. But anyway, but it's, he's starting to get, get a little bit of credit, which is you know, certainly overdue. Um, so I won't go into too much detail about how the whole thing worked, but I think there are a couple of things worth, worth pointing out that I think, uh, in terms of his vision, I think are actually quite, quite interesting. So I mentioned that there was this notion of, you know, the, the framework he developed had, the, uh, had this, uh, facility for managing a top-down classification system with a kind of bottom-up social uh, framework, which I think was a pretty interesting idea and very, you know, pretty far-sighted. Um, he also had this idea that those links between documents could carry some meaning. So that, you know, unlike today's web, which for the most part, you know, hyperlink is a fairly dumb link, right? It's basically this document points to this document. He had this idea that those links could actually be encoded with some kind of uh, Judgment. It could be like this. This document agrees with this document, or this document disagrees with this document. You could even say how like how strong that agreement was, or you know, you could have other flavors of those kinds of relationships. So it's a pre pretty good idea, and something that's certainly lacking mostly in, in the web today. So it's interesting to think about what would the web have looked like if it had sort of come out of Butley's vision. Well, you would have had some a little more of a top-down framework than we have today, which is really you know a pretty purely bottom-up system. Um, this idea of constructing sort of the social space of a document, although I think we have something like that with, with Google, but I think it would have been a little more explicit uh, and visible in, in LA's world. And this notion of links that have some kind of meaning associated with them, I think, is also a pr pretty important idea. So I think we can just look at those and see there's some, some pretty interesting thinking in there that I think is worth, worth pondering a little bit. Um, so, and it's also interesting to look at how, you know, today people are still, you know, people are trying, are starting to approximate some of these kinds of things. So. This is a prototype that was built by uh, some guys in Europe, and it's called FaceTag. It might be pronounced Facet Tag. I'm not sure. It's meant to involve, to basically use faceted classification to enable you to create uh, a top-down framework that has bottom-up tagging within it. If people know what faceted classification is, kind of a library science term, but the idea is you have sort of a, uh, a controlled framework for uh, identifying a, a domain of, of knowledge with some sort of controlled vocabulary within it, and then below that, you have the ability for people to assign freeform tags, and then there's some facility for sort of normalizing terms, uh, disambiguating, and that sort of thing. So there's so, so sort of an interesting sort of step in that, that kind of direction of sort of mirroring a top-down and a bottom-up system. Uh, this is another sort of faceted uh, classification example uh, uh, that uses wine. Uh, basically, it's a, uh, what's this called, Jeff? You probably know what this is called. This is, uh, Peter's friend built this. Anyway, it's a, it's a wine faceted classification uh, prototype. So there's also an interesting proposal floating around to do uh, something like these, uh, these flavors of links. This is a, a proposal that's out there for vote links. And I don't really know where this stands, but it's an interesting proposal. It's basically an idea of expanding the uh, href tag to include the ability to vote for or against things. So it's a very simple, sort of would be a very simple addition to a hyperlink that would let you say this agrees or disagrees with a particular document. So there may be other things along these lines floating, floating around, but this is one that I'm, I'm aware of. So. 
So the next person I want to talk about is somebody I'm sure probably many of you have heard of. Um, a couple of common uh, misconceptions about Bush. One is that his name was actually pronounced Veneever. Uh, I've been I've discovered recently, and uh, his uh, he is no relation to the current occupant of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. So um, happy to report. So he was Bush was a, a, a major figure in post-war, well during the war in the scientific uh, establishment. He was a, a prolific inventor in his own right. Was a science advisor to FDR. Held all kinds of uh, positions, including uh, being president of the Carnegie Institution. He was at MIT for a while. Um, he accomplished a lot. But, but what he's best known for today and his sort of lasting legacy has been this essay that was published in 1945 called "As We May Think." Uh, I actually discovered he actually wrote the essay before the war in 1939, but it was delayed publish. He delayed publishing it because he was distracted with other other things. So, um, so it was in the, that essay that he proposed this idea of a machine called the Memex, and uh, it's certainly I think many of you I'm sure have heard of the, this idea of a Memex. Uh, it's tip, often acknowledged as sort of the direct philosophical precursor of the web, although it doesn't really bear that much resemblance to the web, but there's sort of a lineage of thought you can trace from this essay straight through to Tim Berners-Lee inventing the web. Um, what's interesting about the Memex is it was based on some of Bush's own experience, experiences trying to develop uh, microfilm reading systems uh, during, during the 30s and 40s, and he uh, uh, encountered a lot of technical obstacles to actually implementing his idea. Uh, so when he just proposed his idea for the Memex, he actually had no intention that it would actually be built. It was meant to be a concept car. And uh, he, it really, what he proposed at the time was actually not really entirely possible, given the state of technology at the time. So he decided to sort of liberate himself from the, those constraints and really just think big about what, what could or should uh, uh, this tool look, you know, be able to do. And so what he proposed was a... Uh, what in many ways resembles a personal computer, although there was no such thing as uh, microchips or digital circuitry then, so it was a very analog machine. It was all uh, built around microfilm, and the idea was that a user could sit down at this desk and have access to all kinds of different documents that would be stored on microfilm, and they would be able to pull up two of those documents side by side in the windows at the top there. Uh, they would also have, uh, I believe in the original idea, each user would have a camera on their forehead that would be kind of like a scanner kind of thing. And um, the idea is that you should be able to pull up these documents and then make associations between them. They'd be able to say, this document relates to this document, and then continue sort of building a trail through a set of documents and to create uh, a pathway through those documents that would then be visible to other users who might come in later. So unlike Alt-Lay's uh, vision, Bush saw this as a completely bottom-up system. There was no sort of classification or anything. The idea is it would all be user-driven. And Bush apparently had had some frustra frustrating experiences working with libraries. He felt they were too bureaucratic and institutionalized. And he wanted to basically, uh, basically have users do the work of organizing information you know, within the system. So uh, a couple of excerpts from, from the essay I think are worth, worth putting up here. Um, this is sort of his vision for how these, uh, what he called associative trails would work. So the idea here, again, I won't read it, but the idea is that the user can go in and create a link between two documents. And the, 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 I think the key point here is that that pathway is then made visible to other users. So think about the web today. You can't really see where people are going. Well, maybe you, maybe you can see where people are going, but most, most of us can't see where people are going, right? Um, um, but his idea is that those pathways would become part of the record and part of the sort of you know, paper trail, if you will, of the, of the document, which I think is a pretty interesting idea. Um, he also had this idea that over time, he also used the term encyclopedias, uh, this idea that, that, that sort of new forms of documents would emerge out of this activity, where these, these trails themselves would have some meaning and could be doc, sort of documents in their, in their own right, um, and then would be you know, put back into the Memex, and people could then build on them, or tailor them, or tweak them, and so forth. So. Um, so even though the web as we know it today is, is in some sense an, you know, an outgrowth of Bush's original idea, there were some important ways in which the Memex was actually more sophisticated than the web. One was this idea that links, I forgot to mention this, that links work in both directions. So the idea of you know, this document links to this document, you can see the incoming link as well as the outbound link. That's a pre pretty important idea. 
Also, this notion that the pathways are made visible to, to the user was sort of a critical part of his component of his system. So in a way, the web is kind of a, a much uh, sort of dumber system in a way than what he had in mind, uh, and much more of sort of a one-way street, whereas he saw it as a much more sort of collaborative um, uh, enterprise. So. so, but again, it's interesting to look at the web today and see how people are trying to sort of um, get at some of these ideas. So I think trackback is a great example of an attempt at kind of a two-way link. Right, it's a it's a kind of a ham-fisted attempt. That's you know, big, you know, obviously with spam and everything, it's it's not really completely um, there. But but it's that it's that idea that uh, you could have a document and then see what's linking into it as well as to what's what's linking out. Um, certainly, with something like Delicious, we see at least an attempt at something like seeing a user's pathway. Although it's not really a pathway; I mean, it's really just bookmarks. But at least it's some. It, you know, there's some effort to make the users, another user's sort of exper experience of the web, visible to other users, so that they could build on that and sort of annotate. You know, use that as a starting point to create their own trails. So. <coughs> So the next thing I want to talk about, and I'll probably just talk briefly about Garfield, because probably more, more people here know, know who he was than, than in a lot of places. Um, Garfield was a, uh, uh, a librarian, sort of, in the 1950s, well, he's actually still around, who uh, created this thing called the Science Citation Index. And the Science Citation Index was uh, a, new, a whole new idea for how to create uh, an index to scientific journals, was basically the original idea. And his main insight was that you could learn a lot about the importance of a journal article or, or a book or what have you by actually following, by actually ignoring the contents of it, the contents of the article, and actually looking at the footnotes. And his idea was that if you tracked the sort of uh, connections between footnotes between different articles, you could actually build up a real picture of where a document uh, resided in a sort of larger information space. And that you could look at the frequency of a, a document being cited to assess its sort of weight or its importance. And that you could then look at the weight of the, uh, of the documents that cited it, and that that could then be used to derive you know, some sort of algorithm that would give you some way of weighting the relevance of things, right? So, right, OK. Right, so. So what would Eugene Garfield's web look like? Well, it would probably look something like this, right? So, uh, all right, so, and I believe that your founders cited Garfield pretty prominently in their original paper, uh, when, the, when the original paper on Google at Stanford, I think. So, anyway, so the next person I want to talk about is a guy named Doug Engelbart, and he is a, uh, a major, major figure in the history of, of hypertext. He, um, he's largely, he's, you know, strangely better known, I think, as the inventor of the mouse, which is, he certainly deserved credit for. And somebody actually had a, had a, one of his mice floating around here. Oh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, maybe, maybe later we can have a show and tell. But, um, but when he was at SRI in the 60s, he led a team that developed uh, a pretty innovative uh, System called the online system NLS, and as part of that effort, he was. Uh, this was largely done under the uh, uh, auspices of the Defense Department that sort of funded this work. He uh, also wrote a paper called "Augmenting Human Intelligence." It's up there on the web. It's a fascinating read and very really vi visionary piece of writing about how networked computer systems could come together to create uh, new ways for people to collaborate, to share information, to sort of get things done. Um, what's interesting about Engelbart is he was particularly uh, interested in how uh, computers could help groups of people work together more effectively. So in a way, he's kind of the father of groupware, you could say, although he, had, he had a, did a lot of other things, too. Um, he, uh, so in 1968, he gave a demo that's come to be known as the mother of all demos. Uh, it's a very, uh, it was done somewhere in San Francisco. And this was where he demonstrated a working prototype of, the, of NLS. And he gave this presentation around it, explaining his concept, and he had these slides with pictures of sort of groovy 60s people in their jet airplanes and so forth. Um, but uh, when he finally gave the demo, and I'm going to see, I've tried to give this before and it's never quite worked, but I'm hoping it'll work this time. Let's see. I actually had it up here. All right, let's give this a whirl. Ooh, I think this might work. Of 
complex information structures. Well, we, what do we mean by operating? Well, control, study, modify is the place we started now. We know there are many other analytic things you can do, but we want to get around, study, and modify. And then to further information about what does complex structure mean, we're talking about complex structure and emphasizing structure because we say, although the content represents your concepts, there's a structural relationship between that content entities that should represent the relationship between the concepts of human thought. All right, we never can do that very well with linear text. So inside the computer, we can represent that quite well. In fact, we can represent information structures in a computer that would generally be far too complex for you to study directly. But NLS serves as a tool to roam over that, navigate through a complex structure, be able to find your way, navigate it, move about it rapidly, be able to see what you want to see at any given point. That's how we think of NLS as a tool. All right, these are all very important concepts to us because these together, the bootstrapping, have told us where to start. We start by building an instrument that we can sit at and work during our day to organize the kind of working information we need as a task force developing systems. We need to write our specifications, our plans, our programs, our user's guides, our documentation, our reports, and even our proposals. So we've been using these. So I'm sorry it's so grainy, but that's the only copy I've been able to find out there. It's on real player. Maybe somebody will get it up on YouTube at some point. But um, anyway, so if you sort of got the gist of that, the this, what he was demonstrating was this ability to create basically sort of hypertext trees of information and the ability to actually create um, sort of componentized information and create sort of a, a browsable tree structure that you could then zoom in and out of. And later in the demo, he shows like an example of creating like a shopping list and convert, con turning that into a to-do list and going to the grocery store. So it was pretty, I mean, this was 1968 when people had barely seen a computer screen at this point. He also had a live video chat. He had somebody in Palo Alto in a lab and they were doing a live video conference on this thing. He had a word processor in there. I mean, it was pretty amazing. I mean, he really kind of thought, thought it all out. And uh, this really, this demo became really the inspiration for a whole generation of, of hackers who started like the Homebrew Computer Club and uh, the founders of Apple sort of came out of that. I mean, it was pr pretty, it was a real sort of, um, you know, moment in the, the history of, uh, of computing certainly out here. So it's interesting to think about what Engelbart's web might have looked like. He certainly was more focused on sort of collaboration tools than I think, uh, you know, I think certainly the web for the most part is kind of an in a, in experience tailored for an individual user, but he was very focused on how groups of people could use these kind of tools to, together to share information. He had this idea of process hierarchies, which um, is actually kind of an obvious idea to us now. It's this notion that you could have um, smaller sort of sub sets of functionality that could then be stitched together. For example, you could have in a word processor, you might have like a spell check function or a word or a you know, print function that you could take those uh, features and sort of componentize them and then build new kinds of, app of applications on top of those hierarchies. Um, and he had built an audio and video conferencing. So it was pretty, pretty far-sighted. Um, and again, it's interesting to look at, you know, on the web, how people are trying to approximate some of these ideas. For instance, collaboration is something that, that's not done all that well on the web today, partly because the, I think there's a lack of basic infrastructure to support it in terms of managing identity. And, um, you know, basically a lot of the tools have to be sort of hand, hand rolled. But we see the emergence of things like wikis, which are certainly, you know, uh, I think a response to that need for better tools for people to share and, and collect information in groups. Um, We've got other examples of this sort of thing out there where people are trying to create sort of group groupware tools on the web with, with mixed results sometimes. But, um, but clearly there's, there's a sort of an unmet need out there somewhere that I think it, Engelbart sort of anticipated. And obviously a lot of these kinds of tools are more appropriate within an organization and the web, you know, as opposed to the sort of open environment of the web. But, um, but clearly there seems to be a, a need out there. So I'll talk briefly. I'm not going to say a lot about Xerox Park. I think everyone sort of knows about Xerox Park, but they're really where the, the modern PC as we know it was, was essentially invented. Uh, they also coined, coined the term information architecture back in the, the early 70s. Um, this is an example of an early uh, screenshot from um, 
or the Altair computers. And I think what's interesting there is they had uh, the built the Ethernet was built in very early on, um, and uh, a lot of the all the sort of basic conventions of the modern GUI. You know, really, in a way, the desktop GUI hasn't really evolved much in 30 years. You know, 35 years. So, um, so the, I do want to spend some time talking about Ted Nelson because I think he's, uh, a, to me, a fascinating figure, and uh, he's really probably the guy who is most, other than Tim Berners-Lee, most directly responsible for the web as we know it today. And that's what uh, Berners-Lee himself has cited Nelson as his sort of primary influence. Um, for people who don't know much about Nelson, he's a uh, a really interesting figure. He's a kind of a contrarian figure in the computing industry. He uh, started out as a grad student at Harvard, in the, I think in the sociology department in the 60s. And he started sort of hanging out in the computer lab. And he became kind of fascinated by computers, but he never took a computer course. To this day, he has no idea how to program a computer. Uh, he's a sort of devoutly non-technical guy. Um, and yet, he's proved to be incredibly influential. He, um, he, so when he started working with the people in the computing lab, he, he came to the conclusion that uh, the trajectory of the computing industry was dominated by scientists, mathematicians, and that it was really sort of a very exclusive club that was sort of uh, keeping the, everyone else out. And he felt that a lot of the impetus for the development was coming, was sort of funded by governmental, you know, military, industrial sort of priorities. And he sort of railed against that. I mean, he was kind of a devout humanist. He was, you know, he was about half crazy. Um, if you read his stuff, he's, he's a real character. Um, but he's also kind of a genius. Uh, some of his writing is really, I mean, some of his ideas are just so visionary, farsighted, and sort of on. And yet they're wrapped in a very, his, his writing style is very kind of outlandish. Um, his, his books were all, he's published all his own books and sort of hand set them. So you have to sort of get through his personality a little bit to, to get at the real insights in there. Um, but, you know, this is an example of one of his books, like Computer, uh, you know, Power to the People, you know. Um, and this is probably his best known book, uh, Literary Machines, where he um, explained his vision for something he called Xanadu. And Xanadu, is for an appropriate name, it's become this kind of mythological system. Uh, it's been called the greatest piece of vaporware, you know, ne never built. It was, uh, it's been in development for about 35 years plus, I think. And it's uh, an attempt to create a system that sounds a lot like the web. It's basically a hypertext information environment with sort of a, an ability for users to create new kinds of documents, network them together, and sort of uh, share an information space. And it has a lot of features in principle that the web doesn't have, and I'll talk about those in a little bit. Um, but you know, as early in the early 70s, he was coming up with these kinds of ideas, like a sort of flat network of PCs that were that were um, you know potentially could be potentially unlimited, uh, where people could could create and share information. He also coined the term hypertext in 1968, and uh, this is how he defined it. And this is, you know, a pretty big idea. I mean, nobody had really thought of this in, in these terms before. Um, the idea that you could take a, a string of text and actually break it apart or have it interact with other pieces of text in a direct way was a pretty huge insight that nobody, nobody had really thought in that way about what computers could do before. Um, and he had a kind of, he has a genius for making up words, right? So, <laughs> um, uh, I won't try to explain all of these, but some of these ideas are actually quite provocative. Um, Transclusion, I think, is a fascinating idea. It's the idea that you could have a document that would, you know, instead of just being a sort of simple link from one document to another, you could actually embed a piece of one document inside of another document, and that it would be a dynamic link. So as one document, you know, every document would be live, so you could have kind of a dynamic window into a piece of information that could be constantly updated. And that, so that's what transclusion is. So it's a sort of more sophisticated kind of hyperlinking in a way, like linking in a whole piece of a document rather than just sort of a pointer to it. Um, things like uh, fresh hyperbooks and anthropological hyperbooks. He had this idea that you could have different kinds of structures appropriate to the kind of information you had. So you might have something that was kind of an original contribution, like an original document that somebody had written, and that could be a fresh hyperbook. And then somebody else might come along and create kind of an anthology or tie things together or create an overview of that space. And that, that might call for a very different structure or a different looking and acting kind of thing. Um, and a grand system might be even at a higher level, something that ties it all together. And so as opposed to the web today, where everything sort of has to fit into a web page, he had this idea that you could actually have a very different type of interaction depending on what kind of, what kind of animal it was. So, so it's worth taking a look at Nelson's stuff. I mean, it's interesting. He's, 
Um, his stuff is mostly out of print by now, actually, which is surprising. He's actually, somebody, I talked to somebody who's trying to get an anthology of his writing published, and he can't find a publisher, which is kind of surprising considering, you know, his, his influence, but. Oh, is it? Oh, really? The literary machines? And he gave a talk here, which is on. Oh, really? Oh, I'd love to see that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, wow. Really? Wow. Interesting. Huh. So he's more recently, I mean, he's still going. He was recently at Oxford. I think he left there recently. And he's still actively pursuing his vision with Xanadu and uh, a, a new thing called Zigzag, which I, I confess I don't understand well enough to explain, but it sounds interesting. So this is an example, sort of a, a diagram that's pulled from some of the Zigzag material. Um, and this is one of his original uh, sort, of, uh, sort of diagrams for, uh, for Xanadu, I think. So. Um, so it's interesting to think about what Nelson's web would have looked like, um, even though in some ways you know, we have Nelson's web, but, he, um, but what we have today is really not, not nearly what he had in mind. Um, notions of transclusion, the ability to zoom in and out of information spaces. He also did a lot of pretty deep thinking about things like copyright and intellectual property. And, uh, and one of the real key features of Xanadu was really having protections in place for that stuff at sort of an infrastructure level. Um, it's also interesting to, uh, well, these are some examples of, uh, I think, uh, from Xanadu, this is the idea of like dynamically linked documents. It's another idea of this is transclusion, where you can see that different sections of a document are sort of stitched together. Um, this was an interesting prototype uh, built by a guy named Brad Newberg, who has actually done some work with Engelbart as well. Uh, he developed a sort of experimental web browser called Paper Airplane, where he tried to incorporate things like transclusion and making it more of a two-way sort of browser so the user could use the web browser not just to sort of consume information, but actually to publish back and, and sort of annotate things. So it's a pretty interesting prototype. It's floating around out there, out there somewhere. So what does Nelson think of the web? Well, not, not much. <laughs> And, and you could say this was sour grapes. I'm sure to some extent it is. But, but he has, I think, some good points, too. Um, I love the phrase, the vacuous victory of typesetters over authors. <laughs> it sort of sums up his, his point of view, I think. Um, and, uh, and he still is sort of railing against the, you know, the establishment. You know, so he's a diehard radical. But, but fascinating guy. And I think you know, just, you know, it's certainly worth, worth you know, understanding and appreciating for, for his contribution. You know. So a couple other people, I want to leave time for questions. I'm just going to talk briefly about a couple other folks. Um, Andres Van Dam uh, was actually one of Nelson's early collaborators. He was the, uh, currently the, uh, he's, at, he's been at Brown University for forever. Uh, he's, I think, chair of the computer science department now, or he may even have a loftier job than that. But, but for a long time, he led a lab that developed some of the very earliest working hypertext systems. He worked with Nelson to create uh, the first, uh, what's called the hypertext editing system. And this was in 68, 69. Um, this was before there was a mouse, and so instead of uh, a mouse, they used a light pen and a little foot pedal as a pointing device. It was like a point and kick interface. You know? <laughs> um, uh, uh, and then that system evolved in subsequent generations into you know, uh, more, more refined systems. And then eventually in the 1980s, they started building a system called Intermedia, which was a pretty fascinating system. Um, and uh, I actually saw it, I went around, I saw it briefly when I was in college. Um, they, uh, developed, a, uh, it was sort of a closed network system. It was all built on Macintoshes, and it was basically they created a classroom environment with all kinds of networked um, publishing and uh, uh, authoring tools sort of built in. And the idea was that they, they had things like a, a networked uh, word processor, you know, it, it, you know, drawing tools, audio, video. And the idea was that uh, uh, students in class could go through and actually they would create not just papers, but create all kinds of information in the system that would then be networked together and cross-referenced with other kinds of documents, like, for instance, you know, reference documents or papers. And the idea is they created kind of a, a little Petri lab, uh, Petri dish kind of lab for, for hypertext, where they had, it was sort of a controlled experiment, but they would have like 30 or 40 people in a class actually networking their information together. And uh, they did this both in the sciences and in the humanities. Um, with pretty interesting results. Uh, a lot of the stuff is sort of archived out there, and they created what, some documents that eventually got published as, as websites. Um, but unfortunately, the, this whole experiment sort of wound down just as the web was coming up. They sort of, around the early 90s, they didn't get their next round of funding, and I think part of that was there was sort of a recognition that the web was coming. And I think, unfortunately, like a lot of these um, sort of early alternative hypertext systems, the web has become such a just fact that it's very hard for people to get real uh, you know, research money to fund truly alternative sorts of visions for this kind of thing, because the web is just such a, you know, overwhelming force at this point. 
But it is interesting, I think, to look at some of the recent history and see what sort of ideas were, were out there. So in this particular case, with the intermediate system, um, IRIS was the name of the, the sort of uh, organization that, that ran it. Um, uh, one interesting idea is that they had network connectivity sort of built into the GUI at the GUI level. So you didn't necessarily have an idea of a web browser, but you had a word processor with built-in network features. You had audio and video tools that were built into the, you know, everything was built into the network. So you had sort of tools that were appropriate for the task you were doing that all had sort of embedded uh, you know, access to the network. Um, hyperlinks also worked both ways in this environment. So you could see you know, an outbound link and an incoming link for any given resource. Uh, and it, it was a closed system, which is why they were able, I think, to do things like two-way hyperlinks, which are sort of hard to, in a way, hard to imagine on the web because it would just be overwhelming. But, but in this case, they were able to create, you know, enough of a bubble that they were actually able to use them productively. So, um, so a couple others just to mention quickly: uh, Xerox note cards. I was over at Apple yesterday and felt like couldn't, I had to mention hypercard. So, um, and these are also certainly important precursors, although they were less, I think, less less interesting from sort of a networking point of view, but certainly from in terms of the heritage of thinking about hypertext and how to create these sort of uh, document spaces. Hypertext, Hypercard is certainly an interesting uh, sort of forerunner. Um, and then finally, Tim Berners-Lee, who I think probably we all, we all know who he is. Um, he created the web. And this was one of his early screenshots. And this is actually the next box where he actually wrote the first uh, version of the web run. I was at I was at a conference in, uh, a few years ago, and they actually had this on exhibit at the Louvre briefly, so I got a, a snapshot of it. So, anyway, so um, I'm going to skip through the rest of this quickly. So, just a few, just to sort of sum up a little bit, um, when we think when I think about the web as it is today, and sort of what we can learn from some of these earlier precursors, I think it's in, a few things that I think are interesting to, to think about. One is this notion of you know looking for ways of having more, a more stable top-down classification that could somehow work in concert with a purely bottom-up networked uh, system. I think the notion of two-way linking is interesting to think about, although the implementation is you know, certainly conceptually challenging, but I think it's a powerful idea. Um, the idea of links of pathways through documents that could be visible, um, I think, is certainly something that, that would, be, would be pretty interesting. Um, gradations of links, this idea of links that carry some kind of meaning as you go from one document to another. And, and I think also importantly, this notion of um, the web browser as more of a two-way street, you know, as opposed to sort of a tool for consuming information. And this is something that Tim Berners-Lee himself has said, that he wishes that web browsers had evolved to be more collaborative or to, have, to give users more of a voice um, and, and not just be something that we use to read, but that it could also be used for writing and, and for sort of interacting. And certainly if we look at the popularity of things like blogging tools, we can see the, the demand for that sort of thing. Um, and, uh, also, I think, I, this is the part I skipped over, but I think we're also seeing the rise of uh, increasingly sort of uh, a kinds of interaction online that seem to have more to do with kind of traditional oral culture than with uh, more traditional forms of literate writing. And I think that's interesting to think about from an interaction point of view as well, but that's probably, probably another talk. So anyway, so that's, these are a few references. Uh, I'll leave, I'll put these back up in a minute. But, and then this, I've written about this and um, among other things in a, my book, uh, which I've got a few copies of here if anyone's interested in. And uh, why don't I put these up and see if uh, anyone has any questions. Yep, sure. I think we have, are we gonna do the microphone? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I don't know if you've heard this anecdote, but I guess one of Larry and Sergey's original projects was this thing called Bank about Back Rub. Was which called back rub? Yeah, huh. a thing called back rub. And the idea was to let you see backlinks. Like you, you'd take a page oh, really? and you could huh. see what pages are linking to it. And right now on like Google Advanced, if you do like advanced search, that's one of the options is you can uh -huh. find pages that link to the page. And so my question is kind of about the two-way link thing. It seems to me like something like that, like kind of a separate application or search tool to look for backlinks is about all you could ask for. Because I mean, imagine if I had a page and anyone who wanted to, could kind of right. edit my page and put a link back to their page on it. it right, like right. you said, it'd get like pretty cluttered pretty fast. Right. Well, I think you're right. I mean, I think you wouldn't necessarily. You would want that to to be available at sort of the browser level. You yeah. Know, and not at not necessarily something that you have to embed on the document like trackback. You know. But it would be interesting if that could be more open and available. I think it would also be interesting if you could have more of an ability to sort of um, put some uh, boundaries around that, so it wasn't necessarily totally. You know, looking at everything, but if you within the context of sort of a group of people or an organization, you could actually have sort of more um, 
so, sort of a more of a social view of like you know, a social the, network where someone friends you and you something could accept like that it and then yeah, there'd be yeah. a link on yeah some, there've been some experiments with that sort of thing but we yeah. should have that kind of control I think yeah. and my other question is uh, what do you think of Wikipedia and or social networks and do they do you feel that they've kind of answered any of these uh, wantings. That well, I think, I mean, I have kind of mixed feelings about all that stuff. Uh, it's, I mean, I think Wikipedia is interesting. Uh, I mean, it's fascinating that it's this um, sort of exists right at, the, I think, this boundary between sort of a traditional literate culture and, a, and sort of an emerging sort of bottom-up space, you know. Um, I don't know that it really answers any of these problems. I think it answers some other problems. I think it's interesting to, to keep an eye on. Um, I think in terms of social networks, though, I think we are seeing this... Uh, interest in sort of looking at the social space of a piece of information. So if we look at like a YouTube video, or increasingly you see this, you know, my, my day job, I work at the New York Times, and we're seeing this a lot, where actually increasingly users are much more part of the, the imprint of a particular article. You know, we look at, you know, what's the most emailed or the most popular, and increasingly we're sort of trying to make that more part of the record of these things. And you can look at things like Facebook and see, you know, there's sort of a emerging interest, I think, in having being able to look at a piece of media in a social context and not just sort of for the thing itself. So, so yeah, I think to some extent that that's true. So, yeah. I'm interested if you've done a, a study of the sub area in search and indexing. I, I see uh -huh. search now as sort of evidence of the failure of the earlier ideas for indexing that where now Google yeah, yeah. has this fairly inelegant brute force search. Uh -huh. We've indexed everything and, uh -huh. and we can do some nice things with it. Right, right. But for example, there was a search tool in the early 90s whose name escapes me uh, by Brewster Colley. Uh, where oh, they, uh, Way, Alexa or Waze? Or? Waze. Waze, yeah. Waze was it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And it had a very elegant user interface where you can say, uh -huh. this is relevant, this is not. Uh -huh. um, it, it, have you thought about that area? Well, I mean, the example that comes to mind for me is when Yahoo was trying to um, categorize the whole web. Remember, they, were, they had this whole big, they had an army of librarians going in there and trying to basically, you know, organize every website on the web into some top-down directory. And that was obviously, that just wasn't going to work, right? So I think any kind of manual attempt at doing that is sort of doomed. But, but I think there is... It seems to me the possibility of more um, some kind of controlled information space that might be kind of domain specific. You know, for instance, if you took um, you know the medical world, they have this incredibly sophisticated uh, framework called the MeSH subject headings that are very you know incredibly uh, you know thought out controlled vocabulary for managing medical information. And it seems to me if there were a facility to leverage some of that kind of thinking that's already been done in a specific domain and uh, through some sort of automated process, you know, apply that, and I don't quite know how that would work, but but I think there are, um, you know, th there is, you know, a, a pretty good heritage of thinking about controlled vocabularies that I think is being kind of uh, left by the wayside in the, you know, the sort of bottom-up world of the web, and I don't know, you know, it'd be interesting to see how things happen with, like, the, uh, I'm mean, also very interested in, like, the MetaWeb project and how that's going to play out, you know, in terms of doing more sort of automated classification or mapping of relationships between documents, but... Um, but uh, yeah, it's a it's a good question. I don't claim to have the, the you know the um, crystal ball there, but it's interesting to think about. Yeah. Sure. You mentioned a couple of things you'd like to see at a high level in the uh -huh. web, and early on you mentioned uh, that the web is built on sort of crude low-level infrastructure, uh -huh. uh, and I'm aware that you know one generation's infrastructure that enables a certain level of technology is often an obstacle to the next generation of things. Uh -huh. I wonder if you have recommendations about what sort of low-level technology. Uh, would it enable these sorts of things that you see as desirable for the next generation? Well, I think it would be nice to see uh, web browsers take another step. I mean, it seems like the web browser hasn't really evolved in seven, eight years, really, you know? Um, I feel like a lot of the, the ability to manage your identity, I think, is a critical sort of shortcoming. And I think that would actually facilitate a lot of, uh, a lot of these kinds of things, of having a better sort of identity uh, management facility within the web browser, which would open up all kinds of possibilities of not having to have to, you know, for instance, sign on to every site and that sort of thing. Um, I think, uh, you know, I think most of the, the kinds of things that I would like to see, like the other big uh, thing for me would be having a better sort of session state within the browser. Like the, the fact that you have basically just this flat sort of meta, this document metaphor that we're all sort of stuck with, where we're looking at basically a page that gets delivered, and it's a very sort of antiquated metaphor in a way. It's a print metaphor. Uh, and people over the years have tried to sort of work around that with things like Ajax or, um, you know, Macromedia, or now Adobe is doing some things, trying to use Flash as a platform for doing more dynamic uh, session state kind of stuff. But the, 
you know, the web browser itself just doesn't, I mean, I think HTTP is really just such a sort of brute force sort of simple thing that it really does preclude doing uh, more interesting sort of uh, application-y sort of design without having to come up with uh, sort of, you know, strange workarounds. So, so I think those are a couple of things that I'd like to see that, that seem like they might be possible, you know. So, uh, yeah. I wonder if you had a, I got the mic. Um, You've, you've talked about what it could be and what, what precursors there were, but I'm wondering if you have an opinion of sort of why the web is the way it is. Um, I, I think Ted Nelson would say something like bad drives out good. Right. right. Um, but maybe it was just the right time for it, or maybe it was open versus closed. Well, yeah, I mean, I think the reason the web is, has been so successful is it is open, and the fact that it is pretty simple. I mean, the fact that anybody more or less can build a web page, you know, it, it, it's sort of simplicity is the key to its success. And so you can't, I mean, I'm not necessarily, I mean, I'm not, again, I'm not opposed to the web. I mean, I think it's great. It's, I've made a living off of it. But, um, but I think um, there's, uh, even so, I think there, there's still some basic um, limitations that I think could still be addressed within that framework. And I, I think, but I think, you know, the, the reason that Nelson's vision didn't take off, I mean, for the, apart from the fact that it was never fully built and released, um, it was kind of a closed system. And so I think the openness of the web is really the key to it, and, the, and the, the price of that is some level of sort of a lowest common denominator solution. So that's sort of is what it is. But so, what is a, Mr. Serf, you had a question. Do you want, I wanted to make sure. Oh, I'm sorry, we got one more, and then we'll, yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, would you consider the semantic web to be yet another web that wasn't? I think it's too early to say. I mean, I think that's sort of the conventional wisdom about the semantic web is that it's sort of overblown and, you know, who knows. But I think in some ways it's, it's still entirely possible. that they, I mentioned meta web. I mean, I think it's, that it's entirely possible that could turn into something. I mean, I haven't really seen the details of it yet, but it seems like the right idea. I think things like RDF, I mean, I think there's the potential there. I think what, um, I mean, it seems to me with the semantic web, it's, a lot of the infrastructure doesn't really exist to support it. But I think it's certainly within certain domains, I think it's quite possible where there's a real sort of commercial value to, to building that kind of machine-to-machine uh, -machine level communication. I'm not sure if there's going to be sort of a, an, a completely open public semantic web that's really going to work in the same way that the web worked. I think it's just, I'm not sure if the commercial drivers are there to make that happen. But, but, I, but I, I think the semantic web could, I mean, I'm, I haven't, written it off by any means. I mean, I think it's still early going, so, anyway, so, so, yeah. I guess I get one last shot. It's Vince Cerf. I feel like a dinosaur that wandered into the lecture at the uh, museum. Uh, two observations, one of them, three. One of them is that the web today is still very ephemeral. And so one of the problems we have is the ability to uh, capture something a link, for example, and uh, keep it alive for a long period of time. Right now, binding to a domain name uh, is not a great way of preserving things over long periods of time. So we're missing that element. The other thing that I worry about is bit rot. Uh -huh. uh, the ability to actually interpret the bits that are out there in the net, it depends on the pieces of software you have to help you figure out what the bits mean. Uh -huh. And it, that, too, is very ephemeral. And so if we're trying to think about information systems that last for a 1,000 years, uh, we have a big problem in front of us because the software that helps us figure out what the bits mean yep. isn't permanent or it isn't, is, we, don't, we don't have any mechanisms for assuring that it's there. So uh, in a sense, uh, everything, including today's web, mm -hmm. has the uh, potential for disintegrating mm -hmm. if we don't start thinking hard about how to preserve it. So I leave that with uh, a little I problem think, in your hands. Oh, thanks. <laughs> no, that, I think that, that's a great, excellent point. Uh, I mean, I think there's some risk that, you know, the web we're creating this vast kind of cultural amnesia because stuff that, I mean, I've worked on stuff, you know, spent years working on stuff that there's no trace of it on the web anymore, you know. It's, um, and I think the lack of any kind of archiving facility, I think, is a big problem that eventually is going to become a bigger, a bigger problem. Um, I think it's also interesting, my previous life, I used to work in a library, and it's amazing to go back and look at, uh, you know, there are books that were written, you know, in the 12th century that you can still open up that were printed on like, you know, cows, you know, on vellum, on cow skin, and, you know, and uh, those things are perfectly well preserved. And yet there are disk drives, you know, that are only 20 years old that are unreadable at this point. So, you know, it all seems very permanent, but you're, you're right. I think it may be, may be very ephemeral. So we'll have to see. But yeah, well, thank you. Hey, thank you all. Yeah, thanks, yeah, Alex. Yeah. Yeah.